I want to welcome everybody here, and especially welcome our guest speaker for today, Professor Rona. My name is Daniel Canstrom. I'm a professor here at the law school and also the co-director of the Boston College Center for Human Rights and International Justice. Although the subjects about which we've gathered to speak today are tragic, deeply divisive, and contentious, and in many ways, terribly and relentlessly demoralizing, I'm still honored and pleased to welcome you on behalf of myself, my co-director, Professor Brinton Likes, and our assistant director, Tim Cars. We've organized this event as a modest way to begin to talk in a particular frame about some very, very hard things. A major part of the basic mandate of our Center for Human Rights is to do just this, to confront the hardest issues of our times. And as our mission states, the statement puts it, quote, to nurture a new generation of scholars and practitioners in the United States and abroad who draw upon the strengths of many disciplines and the wisdom of rigorous ethical training in the attainment of human rights and international justice." End quote. Still, the intertwined issues of identity, autochthony, race, ethnicity, religion, gender, democracy, rights, law, and justice in the Israel-Hamas and the Israel-Palestine context have been among the most contentious and intractable problems I've confronted for so long as I've been alive. Personally, I've often found them too poignant, too personal, too complicated, and too painful to even discuss with friends, let alone in public. Since the horrible Hamas attacks of October 7th and the terrible civilian toll of subsequent military actions, many in our community have felt similarly fearful and reluctant to engage. Some have urged us not to proceed today as they fear a rise in anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, divisiveness, and hate. Others have urged us to grapple more fundamentally with all of the deepest ultimate issues all at once. We're grateful for all these communications and we hope to continue respectful dialogue with everyone in our community. But we settled on what we thought was a thoughtful middle way today. Well, beginning actually some weeks ago, we offered a presentation by a distinguished scholar, Linda Dittmar, who had published what we thought was a very interesting personal memoir that grapples with many of these questions in a unique way. You can view that event on the website of the center as well. Our hope was to begin to spark and to support respectful, thoughtful, and open dialogue in our community. That program is now followed today by a law-related one. So let me be clear about something, and this is especially for the benefit of the law students in the room. I do not, we do not, think that the law is a comprehensive or even necessarily a satisfactory way to deal with all of these issues. As Luis Moreno Ocampo, the first prosecutor at the International Criminal Court, once put it when he visited here, he said, the law, according to an old proverb, is like a wooden door frame in a big empty field. You may walk through it if you want to. Well, why would we want to? Well, in part, it's because many of the participants are using legal arguments themselves as the case brought before by South Africa before the ICE, the International Court of Justice shows clearly, and by the way, a decision came down just today, and I have some hard copies of it, and I've sent out some summaries, and we'll have plenty of time to talk about that today, I think. More fundamentally, I think, it's because the law, and especially international humanitarian and human rights law, though again, I want to say conceitedly, an imperfect work in progress, is the place where many of the deepest controversies have crystallized into norms, into tractable categories, into places where some sorts of tacit settlements have been reached about, for example, slavery and torture and genocide and about the rights of a people to self-determination. Again, this is far from a perfect frame and it does not yield easy answers. But compared to the alternatives, alternatives of violence, politics, ideology, etc., I think it's worthwhile to spend an hour or so learning about the history and the structure of the law and some of, the, some of its details as it relates to these, these issues. So let's do that, and my hope and belief is that we'll do it in a way that's appropriate for a great law school and a great university, with deep curiosity, with critical skepticism, with respect for each other and civility, with aspirations to find durable, coherent, and ethically and morally satisfactory answers. Speaking personally, I just want to close with an admonition of the great Lebanese-American poet Khalil Gibran, who actually lived for a time in Boston. My mother used to repeat this to me often, and I find the wisdom of it uh, reoccurring time and again. As Gibran wrote in his masterwork, Prophet, 
Say not I have found the truth, but rather I have found a truth. I think today as we learn about the law, we will find some truths and some things that can help us grapple with some of these incredibly difficult issues. So now let me introduce our speaker. Uh, Professor Gabor Rona teaches at Cardoza Law School. He's also taught international humanitarian law, human rights law, and criminal law at the International Institute of Human Rights in Strasbourg, France, at the University Center for International Humanitarian Law in Geneva, Switzerland, and he's lectured at Columbia Law School and Yale. As the International Legal Director of Human Rights First, he oversaw questions of international law and coordinated international human rights litigation, represented Human Rights First with governments, intergovernmental and non-governmental organizations, the media and the public, on human rights and the law of armed conflict. Before that, he was a legal advisor in the legal division of the ICRC, which is the International Committee of the Red Cross, in Geneva, where he focused on the application of humanitarian and human rights law in the context of counterterrorism policies and practices, and represented the ICRC in intergovernmental, non governmental, academic, and public forum. And he was also involved on behalf of the ICRC in the establishment of international and other tribunals, including the International Criminal Court. His articles have appeared in many venues. Um, we welcome him here. We're lucky to have him. He's going to lecture for a time, then we're going to have some time for q and I want to just remind people of three things. One, this event is being recorded. Two, um, it is on Zoom. And if you are on Zoom and you want to submit a question, please use the Q&A function. Uh, I will hope that we have time, and I believe we will to take live questions from all of you here, so be prepared to do that. And, and if, for whatever reason, you wish to submit a question anonymously, for various reasons we think that might be, uh, some people may want to do it that way, we have some cards, and you can write them and give them either to me or to Professor Likes, who's going to be handling some of this Q&A. So with that said, oh, I also have a few copies of the, um, the, the, the case from the International Court of Justice. So I'm just going to leave them here. If anybody wants to take a look at it, please feel free to come up and grab one. And that being said, I'll turn it over to Professor Ronan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Katzstrom. And, and um, uh, great appreciation for the invitation and for all of you students and faculty uh, who are here today. Before diving into law applicable to this particular conflict, and because so many pe people do have opinions with you know, varying degrees of knowledge about the utility of law in war, the efficacy of law in war, um, I thought it useful to start with uh, some context, some framing, partly legal, uh, partly perhaps anthropological, and um, I start with the premise that what we call the customs of war have existed ever since humans organized into groups for thousands and thousands of years. On the other hand, the laws of war have only existed um, in the international legal sense since about the middle of the 19th century. I want to talk a little bit about um, the customs and the laws. As far as customs are concerned, I'm just curious, have, has anybody ever heard of the Yanomamo people? They're semi-nomadic hunter-gatherers um, that live in the Amazon. And uh, the reason I want to talk about them for a minute um, is because of their conflict resolution traditions and methodologies. Um, they're semi-nomadic hunter-gatherers. They're semi-nomadic because there's, you know, there's no soil uh, worthy of agriculture in the Amazon. So that's, that's the, the means of subsistence. Uh, being semi-nomadic, uh, the, there's a kind of delicate balance concerning the numbers of individuals that can uh, be supported by and support one particular band of people, maybe around 30 or 40. If you get much less than that, um, you can't survive. If you try to get much more than that, you can't survive. And because they're semi-nomadic, the Yanomamo are constantly in motion. And so they bump into other bands of, of Yanomamo. And as a result of that, they have conflicts. They have conflicts over hunting territory. They have conflicts about uh, kidnapping women. 
the point that I want to raise concerning the Anamamo is when they have these conflicts, how do they resolve them? Well, it just so happens that they do so in a very stylized way. Each band selects one individual to represent the band in a chest beating contest. And the two groups gather in a pre-designated space. It may be the space of one group or the other. And the two individuals who are assigned by their band uh, to engage in this chest beating contest meet in the middle, and they take turns bashing each other in the chest. The first person that falls down is the loser. And his band has lost the dispute. The relevance of this is partly that it reflects a methodology of dispute resolution that although it entails violence, it also entails limitations on the use of violence. This is useful for human organization purposes for a couple of reasons. You may feel very strongly about the rectitude of your cause in a dispute, but not so strongly that you want to risk the very existence of your entire group. And that belief is critical and useful only if the other parties to the potential conflict share that view. So on the one hand, there is the time-honored <coughs> sense that there is utility to limits in how conflict is undertaken. Second, depending on whether or not that view is shared by other potential parties to a conflict, you can establish a regime. You can establish some rules. This requirement of at least an expectation of reciprocity on the part of your group and the other group, and the decision that you will distinguish between who is to be fighting and who is to be excluded from fighting are essential to the notions of limiting the humanitarian ill effects of conflict. And people do this because it serves their survival purposes, not necessarily, be, excuse me, not necessarily because they are concerned um, about humanitarian interests, but there is mutual survival at stake. And that's why these um, customs have existed for such a long time, as I say, since time immemorial. Now, on the other hand, let me talk a little bit about the context of international law that embodies some of these concerns and principles. If you were to uh, condense all of human experience, or at least the experience of Homo sapiens, into 24 hours, the laws of war would have showed up about 30 seconds ago. The international laws of war would have showed up about 30 seconds ago. The international laws and mechanisms creating accountability for violations of those laws would have showed up about 15 seconds ago. So when you are thinking about the rectitude and the validity and the utility of laws of armed conflict. Consider how long the customs of war have been around, what purposes they serve us, but on the other hand, recognize that as a matter of international legal organization, we've only come around to codifying these things in international law and then establishing the mechanisms to hold violators accountable in the last 30 seconds of human civilization, if you were to truncate the whole thing to 24 hours. Um, another thing I want to say by, by way of preface, um, I will be talking a lot about um, the conduct of Israel and Israeli armed forces, the IDF, in this conflict. I won't be talking so much about Hamas. 
And the reason for that is not to be construed as a sense of how serious uh, Israel's violations may be as opposed to how serious Hamas's violations are. Hamas's rocket attacks into Israel have always been indiscriminate. That is, they are not directly and specifically targeting military objectives. In that, they are a violation of the laws of armed conflict. They are war crimes. The conduct of Hamas operatives on October 7th to the extent, and this is a caveat, to the extent they, that they targeted civilians are war crimes. They may also be crimes against humanity. They may also be evidence of genocide. There really isn't much nuance to talk about concerning the attacks of Hamas on October 7th. There's a lot more nuance to talk about concerning the Israeli response. And I think you'll see why as my presentation progresses. I want to talk about uh, five areas of international law. And I'll spend a lot more time on some of them than others. But the first question that arises in connection with any armed conflict is whether or not the parties are entitled, as a matter of international law, to resort to the use of force. And that is the area of law called use ad bellum as reflected in the UN Charter. We will then talk, go on to talk about, and for the most part of this, uh, this presentation, I'll be talking about not use ad bellum, but use in bello, which is the law applicable to the conduct of armed conflict. Use ad bellum is the rules on whether and why <coughs> force is allowed to be used, whereas use in bello are the rules about how. I will also talk a little bit about the uh, applicability of international human rights law, which is an entirely separate discipline than the law of armed conflict, or what we call law of war, um, international humanitarian law. I will talk a bit about international criminal law, because there is a distinction between whether or not something is prohibited and whether or not there are the mechanisms available to hold accountable violations and violators. Um, and then finally, I'll talk a little bit about the law of state, excuse me, the law of state responsibility, um, which is particularly in the news today on account of um, the decision that came out this morning from the ICJ. There's been uh, some argument about whether or not Israel and Hamas are permitted to use force in their international relations against each other. Um, I, don't, I don't have answers to a lot of the questions that I'm going to raise. One of the questions that I don't have an answer to is whether or not Israel is entitled to use force in Gaza. My opinion is yes, Israel does. But the reason this remains somewhat unsettled in matters of international relations is because the UN Charter which governs the questions of use of force between states is of uncertain application due to the fact that there is also uncertainty about whether or not Palestine constitutes a state and therefore whether or not Hamas is a state actor or a non-state actor. I, and I think the majority of international legal experts, believe that Israel certainly has a right under international law to use force to defend itself against the Hamas attacks of October 7. I'm just letting you know there are dissenting opinions. The reason I think I'm right and I, and I think others are wrong is because although the UN Charter controls the right to use force among and between states, that doesn't mean that states don't have a right to use force against non-state actors. So while it is, the, it is entirely possible that the UN Charter doesn't govern the question of the use of force by Israel in Gaza, that doesn't necessarily mean that, the, that Israel does not have the right under international customary law to use force. Perhaps the more complicated question is, well, does Hamas have the right to use force in Israel? This is a very tender question because it raises concerns about the right of peoples to self-determination, 
which then also raises extremely controversial questions about the relationship between Israel and Palestine. Questions of occupation. Is Israel an occupying power of Gaza? There is dispute about that. And related, is Israel an occupying power in the West Bank? There is some but less dispute about that. As concerns the experience of international law, there is precedent to establish that people who are fighting against colonial domination have a right to use force as a last resort to vindicate their right of self-determination. The General Assembly of the United Nations said virtually as much um, in connection with the fight against apartheid in South Africa. So there is precedent for the claim that non-state actors are entitled as a matter of international law to use force in order to vindicate a right of self-determination. Of course, then that also suggests questions about, well, who has this right of self-determination? Um, and I think if the right does exist at all, it would certainly exist to peoples on the basis of their ethnicity, their nationality, their desire for a, um, a political organization. And I think a legitimate question can, uh, is raised about whether or not Palestinians have a right to self-determination as against Israel, and a question of whether or not force is entitled to be used to vindicate that right um, as a last resort. Now, whatever the answer to these questions about the right to use force are, they certainly do not include the right to engage in human rights violations and violations of the laws of armed conflict. That's why we have a separation between use ad bellum and use in bellum. Use ad bellum says, do you have a right to use force? You, even if the answer is yes, you still have an obligation to follow and comply with the laws of armed conflict and with human rights law rules. Do not confuse the topic of use ad bellum the questions in the UN Charter concerning whether or not states have the right to use force against each other in their international relations with what is called just war theory. One is law, the other is philosophy and morals. For example, the UN Charter does not enter into debate about whether or not there is a um, a reasonable hope of success in the use of force. It does not even enter into a debate about whether or not the use of force is necessarily a last resort. So some of the elements of what is called just war theory as a matter of philosophy and morals um, are not necessarily aligned with the rules of international law as reflected in the U UN Charter about the right to resort to force. Now let's get to the meat of it. Laws of war, law of armed conflict, international humanitarian law, these terms all mean the same thing. We don't talk so much about law of war anymore because there was a time when the question of whether or not war was declared was significant in determining the application of the law of war. In international experience, um, we've, I think, brought a level of greater humanity to the application of law in war by recognizing that the effects of war on both combatants and civilians don't depend on whether or not someone did or didn't declare war. They depend on the facts on the ground. And so modern international humanitarian law doesn't talk so much about laws of war because of the association from past experience with the question of calling something war and the, the no longer significant 
the importance of declaring war. So we talk about law of armed conflict or international humanitarian law instead. These laws are reflected in a number of sources. First and foremost, the Geneva Conventions of 1949, to which all countries are a party, and to the two additional protocols to the Geneva Conventions that were promulgated in 1977, to which many countries are party. These rules are also reflected in numerous arms treaties concerning biological weapons, chemical weapons, uh, landmines, the use of blinding laser weapons, uh, the use of uh, fragments not detectable on x-ray, the use of uh, exploding bullets above or, or below 400 grams, as one treaty from more than 150 years ago discusses, the St. Petersburg Declaration. Um, what this leads us to conclude is that there are in fact two realms of the law of armed conflict to be concerned with. One realm concerns the very conduct of hostilities. That is, what are the means and methods of, of conflict that are permissible and which ones obviously are not permissible. The other leg of the law of armed conflict are the rules for the protection of those who are exempt from hostilities. Those who, in the French phrase, are hors de combat, H-O-R-S, meaning outside of. The Geneva Conventions contain the provisions on the protection of persons outside of combat. These are, are they include civilians, and so this includes the law of occupation, but it also includes combatants who, for one reason or other, are hors de combat. That would be prisoners of war, it would also be those uh, combatants who are uh, fallen in the field, shipwrecked at sea, um, the dead, as well as the injured. The law of armed conflict has recognized these two separate realms of international law, one that came up through uh, treaties negotiated in Geneva, the Geneva Conventions, others, the conduct of hostilities rules that grew up through negotiation of treaties rather in The Hague and those, so those were called Hague rules. But this distinction isn't so much so important anymore because in the 1977 additional protocols to the Geneva Conventions, which I mentioned before, um, both Geneva rules and Hague rules um, are, are brought together. I do think, however, it is still important for students of IHL and practitioners of IHL and militaries to understand that there are two separate categories of concern. It is not only the concern for the protection of those who are exempt from hostilities, it is also the concern for uh, maintaining limits to how war is fought against even those who are subject to hostilities. Go back to the Yanomama. It's not a fight to the, to the death. It's only until someone falls down. That is a limitation concerning the um, means, or rather the methods, not the means, because means are more about weapons, but about the methods of armed conflict. Whereas the decision of the Yanomamo to designate one individual um, rather than to involve the whole band in fighting reflects Geneva law, the idea that there are a significant uh, number of rules that need to be established in order to protect those who are exempt from hostilities. Um, okay. The most important principles of the law of armed conflict are distinction, proportionality, precaution, and the concept of military necessity. If you read The Social Contract by Jean-Jacques Rousseau uh, 250 years ago, you will know that Rousseau, among other things, said that the only legitimate purpose for attacking your enemy is to disable him from being able to attack you. I'm of course paraphrasing. Once your enemy is disabled, he is no longer the enemy. 
recall Yanamama. What that means is that there's a concept of determining what is targetable on the basis of whether or not it is militarily necessary. Military necessity limits attacks to military objectives. And note here in the definition of military necessity and military objectives as concerns objects, there are two cumulative requirements. They have to be objects that make a contribution to the enemy's military action, but that's not enough. It also has to be determined that their destruction offers you a military advantage. Now you know what military objectives are and what the concept of military necessity entails, you're ready to consider these other um, principles. Distinction. Again, the Yanomamo. You may target military objectives. You may not target civilian objects. You may target combatants. You may not target civilians. Now, even if you are abiding by the principle of distinction, you may, in fact, be causing civilian casualties. And this is especially true in situations in which military objectives are physically intertwined with the civilian population. And nothing presents a better example of that, or a worse example of that, than Gaza because of how densely populated it is and because of how controlled ingress and egress is to Gaza by Israel and most particularly I think because of how deliberately Hamas mixes its military functions with the civilian population. That's a war crime. The principle of distinction does permit civilian casualties, but it controls that permission in a significant way. You may have heard of the principle or the rule of proportionality. There's a lot of confusion about the meaning of this term. It has nothing to do with comparing the 1,200 Israelis killed on October 7th with the 25,000 um, Gazans killed subsequent to that date. Rather, it has to do with a comparison of the military advantage gained by any particular attack as opposed to the civilian harm caused by that attack. If an attack against a legitimate military objective is anticipated, and the word anticipated is important here because we don't engage in Monday morning quarterbacking. We rely on what reasonable, what information is reasonably available to a reasonable commander at the time that the targeting decision is made. And if at that time a legitimate military objective is identified, but it is determined that the civilian harm that would result from that attack exceeds the military value of killing those combatants or destroying those, um, those military objectives, then the attack may not proceed. And if attacks that are clearly disproportionate are, uh, are made, then that is a war crime as defined by the International Criminal Court. Now, even if you are good with your principle of distinction and principle of proportionality requirements, you are not done protecting civilians. There's also a principle of precaution. Even if you've determined that your attack will not be disproportionate, if there are still reasonably available methods to minimize civilian harm, then you have the obligation to undertake those efforts. They may be issuing warnings that an attack is about to ensue. They may be making a decision that, well, maybe we can use a smaller bomb rather than a larger bomb to take out this military objective.
and thereby risk fewer civilian casualties. We may decide, well, we can conduct this attack at daytime instead of nighttime, or nighttime instead of daytime, depending on whether that would change the um, likely calculus of civilian harm. Um, Israel has, prior to launching its attack in Gaza, um, it did issue a warning telling Gazans to clear northern Gaza. It did so uh, in a way that is consistent with its obligations to issue precautions. However, I believe, and I think others believe, that if you're telling a civilian population to evacuate an entire half of their territory, what in effect you are saying is that that entire half of the territory is a military objective. That cannot be so. While there may have been good intentions to protect the civilian population in issuing that directive, I do think it is flawed in the sense that a military objective has to be specifically identified. It cannot be all of your territory or half of your territory. And I think this is particularly problematic in light of the fact that South Gaza also continued to be subject to attack and that, again, um, egress from Gaza is virtually impossible for Gazans as a consequence, largely, of the, res the restrictions placed on the territory by Israel. Um, you now know what the fundamental principles are of IHL. These have to be taken into account. They have to be determined. A responsible military um, has legal advisors at the ready at all levels of armed conflict to give advice to the commander on these determinations. But the decision, of course, is usually um, finally that of the commander and not the lawyers. Um, questions have been raised about the applicability of these rules in light of the fact of asymmetric warfare. One side has greatly greater um, potential to cause harm than the other. Remember the Yanomama. Each side agrees to the limitations because the other side agrees to the limitations. The concept of reciprocity is essential to the ability of international humanitarian law to do its work. The fact of asymmetry between parties to armed conflict does not affect the equality of the parties to the conflict under law. It may affect their ability to conduct hostilities. It may affect the likelihood of success on their part. It does not and cannot affect the question of whether or not each party is or isn't in, uh, obligated to, uh, to play by the same rules. When there are violations, not all violations of the laws of war are war crimes. If you look into your Geneva Conventions, if you take a look at the Convention on the Protection of Prisoners of War, that's the third Geneva Convention, uh, you may note that a detaining authority is obligated to provide prisoners of war with musical instruments. A party that fails to do so is in violation of their IHL, International Humanitarian Law, obligations. Is that a war crime? I'm not aware of any state, I'm not aware of any international tribunal that lists the failure to provide musical instruments to POWs as a war crime. Not all violations of IHL are war crimes. Which ones are? Well, those that are codified as having criminal consequences in either domestic law or in the law that pertains, uh, that, that establishes international tribunals, such as the International Criminal Court. And the Geneva Conventions does list 
violations that must be, that must be implemented into national law with criminal consequences for violations. These are called grave breaches. They include murder, they include torture, a number of other things. Uh, likewise, the International Criminal Court Statute maintains a list of conduct and activities that constitute war crimes. Other violations of the laws of war will not be war, war crimes, will not trigger criminal responsibility. Again, unless there's a codification or at least a, um, a customary norm that states follow that traditionally these violations have been understood to trigger criminal responsibility. Okay, um, how are we doing? Here are some war crimes. I'm not going to go through all of them, um, but I'll give you a moment to just take a look and think about whether they trigger any questions um, for you about their application. I'll, I'll make a couple of comments. Um, because of the rule of distinction, indiscriminate attacks are prohibited. An indiscriminate attack is not one that necessarily targets civilians. It's one that you shoot off without any regard to who will be at the receiving end. It may be combatants, it may be military objectives, it may be civilians, it may be civilian objects. That kind of attack is prohibited. And um, it does constitute a war crime, again, under uh, many domestic law regimes as well as the International Criminal Court. Obviously, uh, disproportionate attacks violate IHL, but interestingly enough, if you go to the International Criminal Court statute, the crime isn't conducting disproportionate attacks. The crime is conducting clearly disproportionate attacks. The rule of disproportionality is such a difficult one that those who drafted the International Criminal Court statute wanted to create a relatively high bar for criminal responsibility. Um, artificial intelligence is a big topic in warfare generally. Israel has been using artificial intelligence mechanisms for determining targets. Um, you probably all know the concept uh, of garbage in, garbage out, which means that what you get out of, a, um, out of an artificial intelligence um, algorithm decision on what is or isn't targetable depends very much on the validity of the information that you feed to create the decision-making process of the machine. If you put into the machine standards that, well, um, say, a gathering of military-age males, that's a highly suspected situation and could or should lead to a, a decision of targetability, that would present some problems from an IHL perspective because that does not satisfy obligations to distinguish between combatants and, and civilians. And there have been concerns raised that the artificial intelligence that the IDF is using um, is too broadly, um, I'm not sure what the right word is, but uh, the information going in to make the determinations is too broad for purposes of, of IHL. Um, Parties to armed conflict have an obligation to provide protection and assistance to civilian populations, including the provision and the assurance that the necessities of life are maintained. That obligation can be met either by directly providing that assistance or by permitting the provision of it by usually neutral and independent um, intermediaries, such as the International Red Cross. But there are many, many other agencies that stand at the, at the ready and willing and able to provide humanitarian assistance in Gaza. And one of the concerns has been that Israel has either withheld uh, 
or has um, simply slow rolled the provision of humanitarian ins assistance into, uh, into Gaza. Um, arbitrary detention is prohibited, torture is prohibited, collective punishment is prohibited. Um, there have been significant questions raised about whether or not the extent and nature of civilian harm that's resulting from Israel, Israel's attacks does constitute collective punishment of the Gazan pos, uh, population. Uh, hostage taking is prohibited as distinguished from the, um, the right and the power of parties to international armed conflicts, wars between state A and state B, to take prisoners of war. Um, okay. I want to talk a little bit about what IHL does permit. Obviously, it, it permits hostilities in accordance with the limitations and the principles I've described before. It permits the occupation of enemy territory in accordance with rules that pro provide for obligations on the part of the occupying power and rights of those in occupied territory. Obviously, it permits the targeting of enemy fighters and combatants at all times. While it prohibits the targeting of civilians and civilian objects, the law of war also recognizes that from time to time civilians do participate in hostilities. And this is particularly true in connection with armed conflicts in which the principal actors are non-state in nature. So IHL recognizes that even civilians may be subject to targeting while they directly participate in hostilities. And in addition, there is the concern, well, a civilian could be a, um, a farmer by day and a terrorist by night. If they're only entitled to be, if, if, if you are only title, entitled to target them while they're directly participating in hostilities, then it means that you can't target them in the daytime when they're farming. You can only target them when they're actually involved in laying down that improvised explosive device on the road. Whereas, under the laws of war, you, a combatant, a member of the armed forces for a state, by virtue of that status, you are targetable all the time. This creates an imbalance. Remember, the laws of war want equality of the parties to the conflict. They want reciprocity. In order to solve that conundrum, lately the ICRC, the International Red Cross, has proposed and a number of states have accepted the notion that civilians may be targeted not only while they're directly participating in hostilities, but if these civilians perform what is called a continuous combat function, they then lose their protected status as civilians as long as they maintain that continuous combat function. Um, the law of armed conflict prohibits deprivation of liberty without the same bells and whistles of due process that you are entitled to in peacetime. There's no habeas corpus, you're not entitled to be charged with a crime, uh, you're not entitled to a lawyer. The law of armed conflict does permit siege tactics. There's no prohibition. However, sieges still have to be um, consistent with the principles of IHL we talked about before. If they exact a disproportionate harm to the civilian population, they are prohibited. That said, a siege of enemy forces, including the starvation of enemy forces, <coughs> is permissible under IHL. One final thought about what IHL permits. If you are a civilian participating in hostilities, you're not violating IHL. Why not? Remember, equality of the parties. IHL wants and needs for all parties to the armed conflict to be subject to the same rules. The members of the Israeli Defense Forces who are fighting in Hamas, who are fighting in, in Gaza against Hamas, they have what's called a privilege of belligerency. 
If you're a member of the U.S. Armed Forces and you're sent to fight in Afghanistan, you cannot be charged with murder for killing Taliban. They're the enemy forces. Members of state armed entities, armed forces, are exempt from the operation of what would otherwise be applicable domestic criminal law against murder, against assault. They have a privilege of belligerency. Civilians who participate in hostilities do not have a privilege of belligerency. They can still be prosecuted under domestic law for murder, assault, etc. But because IHL wants parties to the conflict to be equal, since IHL recognizes a privilege of belligerency for combatants that are members of the state armed forces, IHL also does not prohibit civilian participation in hostilities. Be clear though, domestic law may punish it, but IHL does not prohibit it. These are important aspects to be taken into account, again, especially when you have a, a non-international armed conflict, that is, one between a state and a non-state armed group. What about international human rights law? There is controversy in, under international law about whether or not human rights law even applies in armed conflict situations. Why is this important? Well, you've just seen that in armed conflict situations, killing is lawful, deprivation of liberty is lawful, whereas in peacetime, there's no legality to killing people on the basis of their status. In war, you can kill because somebody is an enemy combatant. In other words, not because of what they are doing, but because of who they are. In peacetime, a police officer can't use deadly force against you because of who you are, at least not as a matter of law. Whether or not a police officer can use force against you depends on what you are doing. It's your conduct rather than your status. And this difference between status-based authority to kill under IHL versus con only conduct-based authority to use deadly force under human rights law makes the question of whether or not human rights law applies in armed conflict situations an important one. The majority of the international legal community and the International Court of Justice and other authorities have determined that human rights law continues to apply in armed conflict situations. However, to the extent that the law of armed conflict, which is the more specialized law that's applicable, has a different rule than human rights law, the IHL rule will prevail. In other words, as to matters that are not addressed by IHL, human rights law continues to apply. There are a couple of states that don't buy into the concept that human rights law continues to apply in armed conflict. One of them is Israel. Another is the United States. Another concern about the applicability of human rights law in armed conflict situations concerns the question of extraterritoriality. States generally are understood by virtue of human rights treaties to take up obligations in relationship to their own territory, their citizens, people on their soil. The question arises when a state operates outside of its own territory, for example the United States in Afghanistan, there's no doubt that the U.S. has IHL obligations, but there is a question about whether or not it also has human rights law obligations. Again, the vast majority of international jurisprudence says, yes, human rights law follows you wherever you go if you are a state agent, at least insofar as you are exercising effective control over the territory in which you are operating. And once again, Israel and the United States demure. Um, 
before we get into the Genocide Convention and the ICJ, um, I'm not going to talk about speech on, on college campuses. I think we just don't have time and it's a little bit too extraneous. Uh, but I do want to talk about, um, you know, we've talked a little bit about war crimes. There's a lot of concern now about genocide because of the ICJ case. Um, there's something else that's an equally important part of the conversation of violations and accountability. And that is the notion of crimes against humanity. There is a potential not only for war crimes and genocide uh, to be of concern in this conflict, but also crimes against humanity. And so it's important to understand um, what the difference is between war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. Well, war crimes, simply enough, occur in armed conflict, and only in armed conflict. You can't have war crimes outside of war. Crimes against humanity or genocide, on the other hand, while you typically associate them with armed conflict, can occur outside of armed conflict. Um, for example, uh, it is far from agreed, again, by international scholars or international courts that there was an armed conflict in Rwanda when the genocide occurred. However, it is entirely clear that a genocide occurred. Crimes against humanity and genocide are capable of being committed outside of the context of armed conflict. Genocide is a form of crime against humanity. Both crimes against humanity and genocide require a deliberate attack on a civilian population that is motivated by animosity against that civilian population on account of who they are, their nationality, their religion, their race, their ethnicity. Crimes against humanity are a number of um, aspects of conduct that can be undertaken. It can be killing, it can be forcible displacement, it can be persecution, that's kind of a catch-all term. Whereas genocide is a very specific form of a crime against humanity, which requires the establishment of evidence of a specific intent on the part of the actor to destroy that civilian population, in whole or in part. Crimes against humanity as a whole do not require proof of an intent to destroy. They may be motivated by a desire to destroy certain elements of a population. They may be motivated by a desire to ethnically cleanse a population, to otherwise persecute a population. But they do not rise to the level of intending to destroy that population. That's the specific and exclusive reason why the law of genocide exists. Um, okay. As to violations, the International Criminal Court has jurisdiction over war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. Questions have arisen about whether or not the International Com uh, Criminal Court has jurisdiction and competence over violations of these prohibitions in this conflict? The answer is simple, and it is yes. This is an interesting issue, though. Um, as you may know, the United States has been a vocal opponent for quite some time of the International Criminal Court, whereas at some times it has also preached and engaged in cooperation with the court. There's been a bit of schizophrenia in the United States of, about the ICC. One of the things that the U U.S. Um, was most vocal about in uh, complaining about the ICC is that uh, the ICC has the capacity to exercise jurisdiction over nationals of states that aren't party to the treaty. That happens when you, a national of a state that's not party to the treaty, commit your crime on the territory of a state that's party to the treaty. The ICC can exercise jurisdiction against either 
nationals of states that are party to the treaty, or anyone who commits their crime on the territory of a party to the ICC. This is of particular concern for a country that happens to have a fairly expansive presence, military presence, in a number of countries around the world. And so the United States has always been a kind of vocal complainer about the concept that this court could exercise jurisdiction over citizens of countries that aren't even a party to the court. Then came Russia versus Ukraine. And as soon as Russia invaded Ukraine without justification, in violation of use ad bellum, the conversation started to change in the United States in, in, in the highest, um, well, mostly in the Pentagon, in the White House as well. And eventually the U.S. came to the view that it's okay for the ICC to prosecute Russians, even if they are committing their crimes, um, on, on the, because they are committing their crimes in Ukraine, even though Russia is also not a party to, excuse me, to the International Criminal Court. So, while the jurisdiction of the ICC remains controversial. The fact is that even though Israel is not a party, Palestine is. And because Palestine is a party, it means that the ICC can exercise jurisdiction over violations that are committed by Palestinians on Israeli soil and also by Israelis on Palestinian soil. Um, there are other potential mechanisms of accountability. As you may know, the UN Security Council has a track record of creating tri criminal tribunals uh, under uh, its authority under the UN Charter. Chapter 7 says that the Security Council has the power and the responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security. Pursuant to that power, this, the Security Council has established criminal tribunals in connection with the, uh, the, the armed conflict in the former Yugoslavia in the 1990s and the genocide in Rwanda. The UN General Assembly also has some power to create tribunals, but this would have to be with the consent of the countries in question. And it has done so, for example, in connection um, with the genocide in Cambodia. There are UN commissions of inquiry that have been established uh, methodologies to, to preserve, to collect and preserve evidence. Uh, there are the mechanisms of the UN Human Rights Council, the, what's called its special procedures systems that I don't really have time to talk about. But perhaps most important, and sometimes neglected, are not the international mechanisms, but the domestic ones. International law is a weak methodology for accountability because, after all, states are sovereign. States decide what they um, allow to be uh, subject to, for the most part, on an international level. And states decide how much to fund international mechanisms for accountability. Um, the International Criminal Court, I think, has something like 15 judges. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even sure what it is right now. Um, how many judges are there in Boston? Hundreds, right? Hundreds. Even in this room. In this room there are hundreds. There are more judges than in the ICC. Um, the international mechanisms that have been established simply do not have the capacity. And in recognition of the fact that they don't have the capacity, and in recognition of the state's um, desire to maintain primary control over accountability, the ICC statute was written such that it is complementary to the right and the responsibility of states to hold violators accountable. The ICC only uh, is triggered into action when the states um, themselves are either unwilling or unable to do so. When states become a party to the International Criminal Court statute, they engage in obligations to implement into their national law the legal prohibitions that are contained in the ICC statute, the prohibitions against war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide. They also engage to investigate 
and to prosecute those crimes. But there are quite a number of situations in which somebody may show up in a particular country, but they committed their crime in another country, and the victims are in another country, and they are not a national of the country that they happen to be in. And so questions arise, well, do local courts have jurisdiction over such an individual? Standard domestic law says no. In the United States, courts generally exercise jurisdiction over <coughs> Americans, where the crime is victimized in American, uh, or where the crime takes place on U.S. soil. However, it is now well understood as a matter of international law that there are some crimes that are so heinous that they are an affront to the entire international community, such that wherever they have been, wherever they were committed, against whomever they were committed, every, any and every state that can get its hands on the malefactor has the right, if not the responsibility, to prosecute them. And that's called the concept of universal jurisdiction. The future of accountability for international criminal law um, lies in part in support for and the development of in international accountability institutions, but the primary responsibility will remain domestic, and I would expect and hope with the recognition of the importance and the expanded use of universal jurisdiction. Um, no time for command responsibility. As we've seen from the ICJ case, there aren't only questions of individual criminal responsibility, there are questions of state responsibility. States are responsible for their violations of international law, and mechanisms have to exist to hold them accountable. And the International, criminal Court, uh, the International Court of Justice, which is the judicial arm of the United Nations, as distinct from the International Criminal Court, which is a criminal court exercising jurisdiction against individuals and is a creation of a treaty, the ICJ um, hears cases of claims concerning state responsibility. Um, so, I hope you, I have convinced you, if you weren't convinced already, that what Cicero said back in 100 or so something BC is wrong even though he's famous for having said it. He's wrong uh, because the principles that animate modern law of armed conflict have existed since time immemorial, have often been honored in the breach, but they've existence, existed since time immemorial. It's only in the last couple of hundred years that the international community has established international law that prohibits waging aggressive war. Only in the last 150 years have we had codification of rules concerning the conduct of wars. POW protections came about 75 years ago in the Geneva Conventions. And only within the last 25 years have we started to develop, to develop international mechanisms for accountability. So this is a relatively young area of international law. As a result, um, I would commend to you that instead of going with Cicero, you go with me. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. We do have some time for questions. Question? There's one? Yes, please. Um, okay, well, I would just like to know, like, in terms of international law, like, what would be the proper way of addressing, you know, a situation where one state has been implementing a regime of apartheid, like, you know, the past 75 years, and it seems like the international law hasn't really done much to address or resolve that situation? You know, let me start with um, the genocide case in front of the, the ICJ. Um, you know that it was brought by South Africa. Uh, I don't think it's an accident that it was brought by South Africa. South Africa has, has long been uh, associating itself with, with the Palestinian cause. But another reason that South Africa is a poignant claimant here is because South Africa has all, also 
um, regularly, frequently, and loudly complained that international justice um, seems to be skewed against weak, the weaker states and ha has not um, been exercised to the same degree against um, Western states, uh, strong, powerful states, um, as it has been against, for example, African states whose nationals make up, you know, much if not all of the, um, of the defendants in, in the International Criminal Court. Um, I think that this is a particularly poignant moment for international law because Israel represents, um, I don't know which metaphor you prefer, the soft underbelly or the canary in the coal mine um, concerning the future of international legal accountability. Um, Israel is a Western state, but decidedly in a non-Western neighborhood. There are significant aspects of, um, of Israel's presence in history that sound and look a lot like colonialism, but colonialism actually went out of style close to you know, 75 years ago. And so um, this, I think, is potentially a turning point for um, questions about the, the equality with which international law is to be applied. Um, on the other hand, remember that we have a United Nations that um, has five permanent members with veto power. The, um, the identity of those five members is determined by the fact, you may call it accident, of who won World War II. Um, it excludes a number of countries with greatly larger populations than those, those five members. And so there's a lot to be uh, said in support of the notion that the Security Council is an anachronism today. However, the Security Council um, exercises a very significant amount of authority about whether or not international justice does get to be meted out um, on, on an equal basis. Um, I happen to think that on the one hand, um, the Israel case now before the ICJ represents an opportunity to turn the corner from the inequality of historic application of international law, but I don't think that's going to get very far and unless and until there's also serious talk of reforming the UN system and the Security Council, about which I am pretty damn pessimistic. Yes, so let's wait for a mic. Sorry, I didn't say that before. Mm -hmm. Let me have some really questions, too. Um, thank you so much, to... Professor Rona, for being here um, and speaking with us so clearly about um, this conflict. Um, my question is, uh, we've seen the United States aiding um, Israel in this conflict um, and aiding in acts that have uh, led to major allegations of humanitarian rights violations. We saw Biden acknowledging indiscriminate bombing and then the continuing aiding of, of military weapons to Israel. So I'm curious about um, humanitarian law and how it governs third party participation and if you expect to see the US held accountable for these acts. Um, international humanitarian law does not have much to say about aiding and abetting other parties to armed conflict per se. Um, the rules of accountability for violations of IHL as contained in the ICC do, do have something to say about um, inchoate crimes, or, you know, um, in, including um, assisting in crimes or, or aiding and abetting. Uh, but as far as the mere provision of arms to Israel is concerned, um, I think that is better addressed by the obligations that arise under the Gen Genocide Convention rather than under IHL per se. The reason I say that is, and, and, and it's important to recognize in that regard, so the name of this tr treaty is the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide. Um, states have obligations to prevent genocide, even aside from whether or not genocide is already happening. 
The ICJ today did not decide that Israel is committing genocide. It decided that because there's a risk that genocide can happen, um, it is empowered to order measures for the prevention, including telling Israel to you know, stop inciting genocide, to take measures to improve humanitarian assistance and, and protection, etc. Um, in connection with the Genocide Convention, there is also an obligation on the part of all states' party, including the U.S., because we are a party to the Genocide Convention, uh, to also uh, prevent the commission of genocide. And that obligation does not depend on a determination that genocide has already happened. And like the ICJ said, um, it is entirely legal and necessary to take steps to prevent genocide, um, including for states to fulfill their obligations. Now, the, the ICJ did not address the United States. The U.S. wasn't a party uh, to, to this case. But I think rather than focusing on IHL, and to the extent that there is indeed a risk of genocide occurring, um, in Israel, as a con uh, in, in Gaza, as a as a consequence um, of Israeli military action, um, and this is that the that the U.S. has obligations to not provide military assistance um, if a determination is you know properly and correctly made that by doing so it is contributing to the the um, reasonable possibility that genocide will occur. It just so happens that in addition to um, the, um, the decision of the ICJ being released today, there's also an oral argument taking place in a federal court in California today in which um, Gazans represented by the Center for Constitutional Rights in New York have filed a federal complaint um, exactly on the question you raised, challenging the authority of the Biden administration to continue to provide military support to Israel in light of the allegations of um, violations of IHL, potentially crimes against humanity, and war crimes. My guess is that that case is not going to get very far as a legal matter because there are a number of prudential doctrines that courts use to throw things like that out, political question doctrine. Um, state secrets, etc. cetera. Uh, but I do think that bringing that case is, is, going, to, is going to raise the profile of concerns uh, about U.S. engagement. And then, of course, uh, to the extent that uh, voters are concerned about these issues, um, I understand we have a uh, an election coming up this year. <laughs> One hopes. Um, I have... Um, Four written questions, and I'm not going to have time for all of them, but I'm going to read one of them that I just chose at random because they all seem thoughtful. Um, this one is, the question is, the use of human shields is also prohibited by law. There's been evidence that Hamas has engaged in this practice in the current conflict to manipulate public opinion. How does IHL deal with this problem, and are those measures adequate? Um, IHL deals with this problem um, directly and schizophrenically. Um, it deals with it directly because there is an explicit prohibition on the use of human shields. Um, on the other hand, IHL also says that just because the other guys are using human shields, that does not excuse you in your attacks of complying with your obligations under the principles of distinction, proportionality, and, and precaution. The question remains then, um, even if those rules continue to apply to you, is there some room to maneuver, some margin of appreciation that an attacking party will be permitted in those cases where the enemy is shielding its military operations with humans? And I think that that's an unsettled issue. One of the ways in which um, discussion among international law people has tried to um, I always forget whether it's circle the square or square the circle, is to distinguish between voluntary versus involuntary human shields. Um, the ICRC, which is where I got my IHL training and with uh, the organization with which I still closely identify, has always taken the position that this attempt to try to um, tweak the determination of how the rules of armed conflict apply depending on whether the enemy's 
um, human shields are doing so voluntarily or involuntary it is, is a fool's errand and can only serve to um, further harm the civilian population because um, it's extremely difficult, if not impossible, to determine, particularly in wartime situations, particularly in, in regimes that are authoritarian or that are brutal, uh, to, de to draw the distinction between voluntary and involuntariness. So the bottom line is that even though Hamas is in clear violation of its IHL obligations by using human shields, Israel still has the obligation to comply with its um, IHL principal obligations. Um, we have a couple more minutes. I want to just take a privilege of a chair and then I'll, I'll, I'll turn to Professor Likes. I wonder if you could just talk a little bit more about this last slide because I think this is something that a lot of students are really concerned about. Um, has this framing actually helped us at all to get you know, anywhere in terms of our understanding of the, this situation? Like, what, what has it done for us? What is it doing for us? What work is it doing? You say it does less than you like, but more than you may think. What is it actually doing, in your opinion? Because I think a lot of people may be coming away from this thinking, this is all really interesting, it's all really complicated, but I'm still sort of back at the fundamental dilemmas that I came in with. Right. So, as you know, you, you were asking me about the counterfactual. Right. You know, what if IHL did not exist? Um, and um, I don't even know if anybody's done empirical studies on, uh, or if it's possible to do empirical studies on what would happen if IHL um, didn't, didn't exist. Um, I can answer this more by anecdote, and, and simply this is an admission that I don't know, I don't really know the answer to the question. Um, but by anecdote, uh, when I was working at the ICRC, um, and occasionally I was called into the president's office, and he had a, he had a, um, a plaque uh, on the wall behind his desk, uh, which was given to him by Nelson Mandela. And um, what the plaque said that was that um, the, the value of the ICRC and of humanitarian law is not so much in what it does with its presence, but in preventing what would have happened in its absence. Um, so uh, here's someone with learned experience um, of, about how the existence of IHL and the existence of institutions like the ICRC, and I'm going to take one step further, institutions of accountability like the International Criminal Court, um, serve to create protections that simply otherwise wouldn't be available. Um, one other anecdote, I, uh, when I was in the, in, in the DRC, in Congo, and, uh, for the ICRC, and traveling to some extremely I mean, this is a country that has been uh, the, the victim of so many different wars um, over a long period of time, and we traveled to some pretty remote places. Um, one interesting thing that, that happened, though, was that um, in our interactions with armed groups, some of them extremely brutal ones, um, we all of a sudden, and this was in, in the early 2000s, uh, shortly after the ICC came into existence, started to get questions about this thing, this ICC thing. Um, fighters were really were aware that it exists and were really concerned. They were never concerned that they would be held to account by their own legal mechanisms in their own countries. They, you know, those didn't exist or they had no concern or faith in them. But all of a sudden, they were knowledgeable of and interested and worried about this thing called the International Criminal Court. Yeah. Well, as Judge Weiner knows, it can get pretty cold in the hay when you're, <laughs> you're a defendant. Um, all right, Professor Lex, last, last question and then we're going to... Well, we're, yeah. I think the time is up. I'll Go ahead. Oh, all right, we'll follow. I'll address I, so, my last question to you afterwards. Okay, and I, I do want to say to people, uh, Professor uh, Rona has been very um, generous in that we're going to have a follow-up session in my class, which is at 3 o'clock. It's a 1L elective class. I've invited a number of faculty to participate in that. So if you're really interested in this subject in a more granular, nuanced, and technical way even than this, you're welcome to join us. It's at 3 o'clock in room 411, and it'll be a more open-ended, free-flowing, more specific conversation. So feel free to come. You're all invited if you want to do that. But for now, let me express my great gratitude.